In this video, we're going to talk about something called the cyclic subgroup generated by an element of a group. So let's suppose that we have a group G. So we'll say uh, G is a group. And let's say that A is an element belonging to G. Here is a definition. We define this thing, angle brackets A, the cyclic sub, uh, subgroup of G generated by A, underline, to be the following. Angle brackets A, or cyclic subgroup generated by A, equals the set of all powers of A, where N is an integer. So N could be positive, negative, or zero. So we might write that out and just sketch it out like this. So we have, uh, so I'm just putting a few placeholders here. We have a to the zero, which is the identity, meaning that this subgroup, this thing that we're claiming is a subgroup, we actually need to prove that it's a subgroup, but it's always gonna contain the identity. It'll contain a, because that's a to the first, and then every power of a is in there. But remarkably, we also have a to the minus one, which is a inverse, and then a to the minus two, which is uh, the square of a inverse, and so on. Now, one thing to note is that this set could be could be infinite, and often will be, but it could be finite. Because if I'm in a finite group, then I don't really have infinitely many different spots for these things to fill. I mean, the, some, there, there's going to have to be some repeats in here somewhere if I'm in a finite group. So this could be finite, could be infinite. It could be that these elements sort of wrap around after a while. They, uh, they start to repeat one another. Okay, but that's the, that's the definition of this set right now. And really, all that I know at this point is that it's a set. The fact that this is actually a subgroup of G is a theorem. So I'm going to prove that the subgroup generated by A really is a subgroup of G. Note that I'm using the less than or equal to notation for subgroup. All right, so here's the proof. So let's try test driving that one-step process for checking that something is a subgroup. Uh, the one-step process is, uh, we'll show this by proving that first of all, this set is not empty and spoiler alert, that's gonna be pretty easy to do because we've already established some things that are elements of this set, including the identity. Uh, so we're gonna prove that and, and that'll just be one sentence. And we'll show that, now normally the one-step subgroup test tells us to prove that if A and B are in the uh, set, then A times B inverse is also in the set. I want to hold off on using the letter A because that's already in use here. It represents a fixed element of G. So I'm going to say this instead. If B and C belong to this set, then B, C inverse belongs to this set. So that's going to be the agenda here. Okay, let's move down a bit. Okay, so first of all, the set's not empty because this contains a to the zero, which is equal to one. And I could have picked anything. I could have said it contains a because a is in the set. I just kind of like to talk about the identity because it's a special element. And that's something that we need to have in a subgroup anyway. So that's nice to know. Uh, so now to prove the other thing, I uh, suppose Let's include a transition word there. Now, suppose that B and C both belong to angle brackets of A. We will show that B, C inverse belongs to that same set. Okay, now again, this is an exercise in unpacking definitions. Let's return and see what it means for B and C to belong to this set. It's really important that we follow that when we write this proof. So you'll notice we said what it means to belong to the set is that you are some integer power of a. Could be positive, could be negative, could be zero, but have to be an integer power of a. So, since, since b and c both belong to a, there exists, so actually we're gonna need two integers here. We're gonna need an m and an n, both integers such that b equals a to the m, and C equals A to the N. Because again, that's what it means to be in this set. It means that there is some integer, uh, here we're calling it N in the definition, but we can call it whatever we like, call it M, 
could call it n, so that b and c are that power of a. All right, so we know now a little bit about b and c and can work with them. So, so now I need to investigate b, c inverse. What is that? Well, that's a to the m times the inverse of a to the n. Okay, but now what is that? I claimed in a previous video, and we haven't given a formal proof, but we're going to take it as having been proven because you can do it. It's, it's just a little bit of an exercise that properties of exponents work. That is the ones that, that work for groups. Uh, we know that they work. Those are the sum of exponents rule and the product of exponents rule. So in this case, we've got a to the m times a to the, and then negative 1 times n. That's just negative n which means I can rewrite this whole thing using the sum of exponents rule as a to the m plus negative n. And I'm just going to stop there. I could also write that as m minus n because we have operations of addition and subtraction on integers. But really knowing this is enough because since m and n are integers, that was what we said at the outset, we know m plus negative n also is an integer. And because we know that, and because we know that bc inverse can be written in this form a to an integer, this makes this element in that set that we defined above because that's what it means to be in angle brackets A. So we know BC inverse belongs also to angle brackets A. And so by the one step subgroup test, And I'm running out of room, so I'll give myself a little bit more room here. By the one-step subgroup test, this is indeed a subgroup. Yay. That deserves an exclamation mark, because that's a really important result there. So this gives me a way of generating a, literally, I, I did not intend to make a pun there, but I guess that is kind of a pun, generating a bunch of different subgroups of a given group. Uh, I can just pick an element and then take all of the powers of that element, all the integer powers, including positive and negative and zero powers. And if I do that, I will have a subgroup. Now, some of those subgroups will be the same as one another. I might not get a whole lot of different subgroups that way, but it is a way of producing a subgroup. So now let's do some examples. Uh, actually, I'd like to do this with the, with the definition in view. So I'm going to leave that there, and we'll do examples up here. So examples. Let's suppose that my group is D4, which we're pretty familiar with now. And let's talk about the subgroup generated by R90, okay? Well, I know that R90 to the zero is R sub zero. I know R90 to the first is just R90. I know R90 squared is R180. And I know R90 to the third is R270. And then at this point, if I look at, what did I just write? Uh, R270, there we go, 270, better. And I know R90 to the fourth, well, that takes me back to, I guess I could call that R360, but that's really the same as the identity, R0. And that pattern is going to continue. R90 to the fifth would be R90, R90 to the sixth would be R180, and so on. But I'm not done because I need to also consider negative powers. So what is R90 to the minus one? Well, one thing that we can notice here is that, uh, now watch my pointer, multiplying this, this R270 by another R90 took me back to the identity. So that means that R90 inverse has to be R270. So what I'm saying is if you get to this point where you have some positive power of an element equal to the identity, then I think you could say that the previous element in the list, the previous entry in the list, is the inverse of this thing. Because multiplying by another one of these things, star, gets us back to the identity. So that makes this the, uh, the inverse of R90. So composing inverses of R90, I don't think is going to give us much of anything different. We've already accounted for this, this R270. And if we keep going, well, we're going to get back to R180, R90, and then back to R0. So really, this is the entire step. This subgroup is R0, R90, R180, R270. Cool. So that's one example of a cyclic subgroup generated by an element. By the way, what is the meaning of the word cyclic? Well, I feel like this example gives kind of a nice hint as to that word's meaning. Uh, what this means is that in a lot of cases, when we work with a subgroup generated by an element, we end up doing this cycling where we start with the identity, and then we have the element itself, and then it's square, and then it's cube, and so on. And then at some point, not necessarily the fourth power, but sometime, we might return to the identity. 
at which point we start cycling again. So really, I could better represent this process not as a linear process, but as a cycle, where each arrow represents multiplication by the generator. And then we are back home. And then again, you can find the inverse of this element here by just starting at the identity and going backwards in the cycle, which is kind of cool. Now, this kind of cycle will not always occur. I may get an instance in which I have a cyclic subgroup that is generated by an element but does not actually form a cycle because we never return to the identity. And that's the next example. So let's pick a different color now. Let's use green. Okay, let's say that G is the group of integers. The operation is addition. And let's investigate the cyclic subgroup generated by five. All right, well, now this time I'm going to use additive notation for this group because my operation is addition. This is abelian. So 0 times 5 is 0, 1 times 5 is 5, 2 times 5 is 10, 3 times 5 is 15, and I can keep going as long as I want. I can make this video 30 minutes long, but I'm never going to return to 0. So this is where we really have to be mindful that we are also accountable for negative powers, or in this case, negative multiples of the generator, so like negative 5 and then negative 10 and so on. Because if we don't include those, we don't have a subgroup because we don't have inverses for all the things in our set. So this is a nice little picture of this cyclic subgroup. And yes, we do still call it cyclic, even though there's no point at which we cycle back to the identity. Because there is still just one generator that creates all of the elements in this group. And that's what it means to be cyclic, is <clears throat> if H is equal to the subgroup generated by G for some G in the group, then H is called a cyclic subgroup. If it can be generated by just one element of the group, it's cyclic. And in fact, we can use that same terminology for an entire group. If I can generate an entire group by using just one generator, then I have a cyclic group. And interestingly enough, D4 is not cyclic because there is no one element of D4 whose cyclic subgroup is all of D4. Uh, you will always get little pieces and parts, but you'll never get the whole thing with one generator. But actually, this group over here, the group of integers with addition, this is a cyclic group. It's just not cyclic generated by 5. It's cyclic generated by something else, and that something else is 1. Or in fact, could be negative one. You could also use negative one to generate the whole group because then you've got zero times one equals zero, one times one equals one, two times one equals two, negative one times one equals negative one. Every element of the integers is a, and I'm using quotes here, is a power, or really in this case, a multiple of the generator one. So because Z is equal to its own subgroup generated by the single element one, that means Z is cyclic. Okay, so that was a very fast and very sweeping introduction to the idea of a cyclic group. We're going to explore more of these in the next chapter of the book.